Yes. Okay, excellent. Oh, good. Uh, okay. I was wondering what was happening. Okay, my name's Dave Hart. I'm the moderator here. Um, I've got a question for you. Do they still have peach orchards out there uh, between Grand Junction and Palisade? Oh, yeah. Well, my, my uncle had a peach orchard out there. I just thought I would share that with you before we got started. What was his name? Uh, Sidney Hart. And this is, by, okay. this is like 60, 70 years ago, so. Yeah, okay. Long time ago. But uh, right. he scared the living daylights out of me. Is there a place, is there like a, a monument west of town that you can go up? Yeah, it's a gorgeous uh, place to go. Well, he scared the living daylights out of me when I was about 10 years old. He had an international scout, and he drove too fast going up and down that, that monument, so. Oh, no. Anyway. Yeah, there's some steep 1,000-foot drops there. Yeah, it so. was very scary. Sorry uh, for that aside there. Well, it's <laughs> nice to have you this evening. Um, let me tell you a little bit about, uh, I'm going to tell everybody here a little bit about your background. Okay. That's, sounds like uh, you and your wife, uh, Mary Jo, uh, are founders of Alpha Omega Institute, and you're both, you were math and science instructors, and you, uh, you ran into uh, some problems with uh, evolution in the classroom, <laughs> needless to say, and uh, with your personal contact with the students, you were convinced of the importance of the issue of creationism, um, and you've developed and expanded your ministry uh, with this evangelism evangelism and Christian growth and you founded uh, Alpha Omega Institute in 1984 and you've and you've spoken extensively uh, in churches and universities and camps and tours throughout the United States and internationally so thank you for all who are here um, we're uh, going to hear from Dave Nutting on the amazing creation designs found in Costa Rica. Thank you, Dave, and we look forward to having your message. Well, it's good to be with you all and all the people that are tuning in uh, via the uh, Internet as well as in person there at our uh, church with our friends there at, in Hastings, Nebraska. So it's really good that you're doing it. I am really glad you're doing a forum like this. I think that's a, a wonderful thing to be doing. So God bless you. And uh, we're going to start on the amazing evidence for design in Costa Rica. All right. And so let's go ahead and uh, think about it. The backdrop of when we do these programs, a lot of times, if we like to give a biblical framework as well, sometimes be able to tie it in a little bit more or less, but you'll see that we can do that. But first of all, when you read the biblical record, Genesis 1 to 11, it's a good framework. Good framework for all of science. We start with creation and design. And uh, basically, when you see creation design, you see beauty. Oh, yeah. Well, beauty is an example of design, but it actually goes a little bit further than that. The inner workings of things that we'll be able to get to tonight. We see a lot of great design. But you also see death in the um, uh, world around us. And in Costa Rica, things do eat each other as well. And uh, so that is explained by the second part of Genesis, uh, where you see the fall in the, in, from the Garden of Eden. And you see thorns and thistles. And in Costa Rica, you see trees like this with so many thorns. Uh, thistles and thorns and you don't want to try climbing those things <laughs> that's for sure and uh, the next thing you see is flood and destruction and we do see that too in Costa Rica uh, and then the dispersion after the uh, uh, Tower of Babel that you can see there too and so when we give tours to Costa Rica, we like to point out all of these things and show how it all fits together. All right. In Genesis 1, it says things were created after their own kind, not one kind changing into another kind. And in fact, we see that distinct kinds both in the living record and in the fossil record. And so uh, that means there's no evolution. <laughs> um, 
the one kind is not changing into another kind. We also read in Isaiah 45, 18, that God created his creation, not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited, to fill the ecosystems that are around there. And um, when we look at Costa Rica, we see a lot of ecosystems. You know, um, Costa Rica is, uh, say, 25% the size of uh, Nebraska, thereabouts. And yet it has one-tenth of the Earth's land mass and only. But let's look at this one. 5% of the world's biodiversity you can find in the little country of Costa Rica. And so why, this? first of all, this great diversity? The unique location. You have varied topography and many geologic processes. And so that's going to result in varying climatic zones, differing ecosystems, and a multitude of niches. Look at that little arrow pointing to the little country of Costa Rica. You'll notice something. There's ocean on both sides of that country, just like there is in the United States, but it's from one place in the uh, in the country. You can look over and you see both the uh, Atlantic and the Pacific oceans, all right? So oceans, that's going to make an ecosystem. You're going to see design that's going to specifically fit that kind of ecosystem. You go all the way up to the top of the tallest mountain there. It's close to 13,000 feet, and you see a different ecosystem. So you have another set of, of plants, etc., that show great design. But another major controlling factor of some of the things that you see in Costa Rica has to do with the, I'm going to call them the... Uh, drifting plates there's plate movement of the oceanic uh, uh, crust so you see that but there are three different plates that pretty much collide right there in costa rica if you know anything about the volcanism usually when you have a subduction of a uh, oceanic crust underneath the continental crust it causes um, influx in the mantle or changes in circulation to the mantle, which can cause volcanic eruptions. And when you look in the Costa Rica, especially this part of it, we find out there are a lot of, of volcanics, a lot of uh, extinct ones, but also several still live volcanoes, which is, to me, I love seeing them. Uh, 2006, Aranol looked a little bit like that. And Poas, steaming and whatever. That's another volcano, Irazu. Um, gorgeous uh, volcanoes, volcanic action. We don't see a lot of volcanic action going on there, but it is still not totally dead. But all of this volcanics, that causes destruction if you have a bunch, right? But keep in mind one thing about destruction. We read in the Bible, what about our lives and our hearts? Guess what? We have destruction being turned into beauty because the volcanic soils um, and all the ash make for extremely fertile, fertile soils. Plants grow like crazy. The climate is uh, very conducive to the plants, etc. And we see tremendous vegetation uh, all over. And uh, even though we do see some savanna type stuff. And so you see beautiful plants. We see beautiful things, even like monarch butterflies. Now, there's my first design feature. Think about a monarch. A lot of you know about the monarch. And the monarch can... Uh, migrate all the way, say, from Canada all the way down to Mexico in a couple generations even. So somehow or another, they pass that on. They go all the way down, then make the round trip from Mexico back to Canada in one sitting. I, whoever thought the monarchs could fly that well? But they do. And um, But in Costa Rica, we do find monarchs too and the monarch butterfly however 
doesn't migrate. I wonder why. Because they love it there in Costa Rica. They don't need to go anywhere. So they're, ha they're happy as a metal arc. Okay. Anyhow, you know, when we look at things, um, I say you see design all over. Romans 120 tells us that. For since the creation of the world, his, God's, invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. And then it says something else, just verse 22. Professing to be wise, they became fools. Who's the they here? Those who do not honor God as God or give him thanks. And basically, many people we see today is, ah, there's no God. Uh, he's not, there's nothing there at all. In fact, they'll say, you can't recognize design. I think we can. For a backdrop on that, we can recognize design, even though the um, naturalists would say you can't. Mutation and natural selection could produce amazing features that you think was design. However, when I look at that um, painting there, I know it did not come as a result of, a, say, an explosion in a paint factory. I know that. And I don't have to see the artist who painted it to understand that. But I do know that oil and canvas don't line up that way. And I can wait a billion years and you're not going to get that painting, are you? But anything can happen given millions of years, right? No, not even that. So let's apply that thinking when we see the various uh, ecosystems, the various plants of Costa Rica. There are 12,000 species of vascular plants. And there are 1,400 species of orchids alone in, coast, in that little country of Costa Rica. What's interesting is that each species has its own fungus. And the fungus provides nutrients for the rooted, um, uh, you might say, for the uh, orchid. Now, orchids uh, don't like to have their feet in water. And so they do not. And so they have a, a different system. But they need that fungus for the nutrients and yet 1400 different species own each of its own fungus uh sounds like it was designed to work together god knew what each one of his species of orchids needed and provided for that okay you know <clears throat> there are more than nine thousand species of butterflies and moths i love them too my favorite is the blue morpho. I can remember the first time we went down to Costa Rica. Uh, that was on a major anniversary. And we went down there. I was praying. Oh, God, I've heard about this morpho butterfly. And Mary Jo began praying and says, oh, Dave wants to see a morpho butterfly so badly. <laughs> And uh, sure enough, I got to see one up close. And in fact, very close. <laughs> I got to see these morpho butterflies. And uh, praise the Lord. You look at these beautiful blue morphos. But did you know something? Blue morpho butterflies are not blue. Hmm. He said, wait a minute. I see the blue. It's right there in front of me. Yeah, you think you see blue. Um, but no, blue morpho is not blue. Here's the underside of the blue morpho. And uh, who would ever think that uh, it was the same butterfly, but it's the same one. Anyhow, um, well, how does it get this beautiful blue look to the wings? You know, you look at a flower and it has certain pigments, which will uh, absorb all the light co colors, except for maybe red. And what do we see that flower as? Red, uh, a red flower. and But that is due to pigmentation. Whereas the wing of the morpho butterfly is different. It is clear. This is what it would look like 
It is uh, made of a clear protein, colorless, called kit chi oh, well, chitin. Yeah. Uh, but there's no pigment for the color blue that allow that to be reflected. Nothing like that at all. It has a completely different system. The intense iridescent color is produced by what is called constructive interference. And what happens is, you notice those scales? Lots and lots, thousands of tiny scales on the wing of the uh, blue morpho, or the morpho, the clear one. <laughs> and uh, each one of those scales have a whole series of ridges. We call them laminae. And what happens is the light can come down and what if the constructive interference was allows that light to come down there. And the only thing that comes out is blue, even though it's a clear uh, a scale. It comes out, but by constructive interference, it not only comes out as a like a reflection, but it is amplified. It is amplified clear uh, several times so that uh, an airplane pilot can see a group of blue morpho butterflies on the ground from 30,000 feet in elevation. That's way, way up there. 30,000 feet above the ground. Um, and by the way, Bill Browning, who has been very active in the uh, Denver Rocky Mountain Creation uh, Society there, um, I've gotten to know him very well. He says the spacing of the laminae must be precisely controlled to a certain fraction of the wavelength, one-eighth. Approximately about a million la layers of these laminae are meticulously arranged with incredible accuracy on the wings. And uh, basically, if you want to know more and a little more detail, go to our publication, Think and Believe. Uh, that would be discovercreation.org. Go to the resources and um, you'll find uh, Think and Believe or just type in the search function, Morpho Butterfly. Even Morpho will get it for you. And it'll come up to that article on our past issue of Think and Believe. You know, the whole thing that we look at too when we see the intricate detail of the blue morpho, how things have to be per perfectly spaced or doesn't work. How did that happen, you know, without an engineer having done it? We think about the verse here. The works of the Lord are great, sought out of all them that have pleasure therein. His works are to be remembered. So remember that when you hear about a blue morpho, it really is a good uh, evidence of God. However, there is an opposing worldview other than the biblical worldview, and that is of naturalism. Okay, Richard Dawkins, famous atheist, says the battle over creation versus evolution, it's not that. It's a battle of naturalism versus supernaturalism. It's an idea, is there a God or isn't there? And uh, Richard Dawkins is arguing for no God, okay? Uh, naturalism. But under naturalism, uh, basically that means everything in the world has to be explained only by natural processes, and there is no God whatsoever involved. You can't invo involve uh, theistic evolution or anything like that. It's all naturalistic without God. But here's what naturalism says about the blue morpho, or even our eyes that are uh, basically experience such a tremendous beauty and intricate design. He says, we can imagine how mutations and natural selection acting over millions of years might refine or produce systems. Did you notice there are two big words in there that are not scientific? Imagine and might. You might say the imagine, a wishful speculation to try to explain something without God. That's what we look at when we see naturalism. 
Mutations and selection. Well, natural selection? Hmm. Does that really work? So every one of the naturalistic explanations for whether you're looking at the blue morpho, you're looking at your own eye, or even your brain, okay? Even your brain. Every one of those, it, and maybe the mom and your beetle that most of you are familiar with, every one of those can be explained by naturalism, by the idea we can imagine, <laughs> Uh, how mutations acting over millions of years. So you have mutation, selection, and the heroes of time. Okay, heroes of time, millions and millions of years. So those are the key ideas for naturalism. And so I think we can use our brain. Okay, thinking is allowed, in other words. And I'm think looking at the blue morpho, or if I look at the intricate details of your eye, I see an amazing engineered system that natural processes are, it will fall way short and can't explain. Okay, naturalism. I, you know, I like to go when we do seminars all over the country. I like to explain to people, especially when I do a design lecture, that naturalism evolution is not science. Okay. It is a philosophy of how we got here, posing as though it is science. And so if you can wrap your brain around that one, we'll understand our students in schools all over this country, all over the world, are being taught only naturalism without God, without a designer. Forget intelligent design, etc. And if that's all you're taught, you grow up believing in naturalism or understanding it, and guess what? You're dead in the water in your faith frequently. And the high percentage of the young people from evangelical church homes, uh, it, as many as 75 to 85% who start from evangelical church homes, by the time they're out of college, reject the church. Why? Mostly because of evolutionary naturalism. All right, thinking is allowed. And I think we can use our brains to look at the design and see there really is a designer. You know, does mutation and natural selection work? According to this book written by Dr. John Sandford, um, this whole idea of mutation and natural selection doesn't work. In fact, in his book, he calls the primary axiom of Darwinian evolution is that evolution proceeds by mutation and natural selection. Can I add over millions of years? It does not work, period. And in fact, John really knows, Dr. Sanford really knows uh, his genetics um, I've had an opportunity to revisit with him again here just a little over a month ago. Uh, but anyhow, he's a retired Cornell University professor. He is a genetic researcher, and you might call him a very good one. And he does good research. And he has over 70 scientific articles peer-reviewed and 25 patents. Okay. He's also the co-inventor of the gene gun process, which was used to uh, sequence the DNA. So the guy is no slouch. Uh, he knows what he's doing, and he does good research. And he said, careful analysis. That's what part of research right there. Careful analysis on many levels consistently reveals that the primary axiom, evolution proceeds by mutation, natural selection, is absolutely wrong. Okay, that's his uh, 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 conclusions. And you can get this book, by the way, from us at the AOI, if you just want to uh, go on discovercreation.org, and you can find it. But he said this, mutational entropy, that's this downward trend that it produces. That's kind of a, things are wearing out. Okay, mutational entropy appears to be so strong, especially within large genomes, 
that selection should not be able to reverse it. He continues, it is now clear that mutation selection cannot stop the loss of genomic information. So mutation selection clearly could not create the genome. Then in summary, if mutation selection can't prevent the degeneration of the genome, he says, then the primary axiom is wrong. It is not just implausible. It is not just unlikely. It is absolutely dead wrong. It is not just a false axiom. It is an unsupported and discredited hypothesis which can be confidently rejected. Remember that, confidently rejected. Wow. Well, let's uh, think about it then with other things we're going to look at. We have over 250 species of uh, mammals. And bats make up about half of them, by the way. Uh, but anyhow, let's look at one of them. It's called the sloth. How many have heard that uh, uh, the dinosaurs that had the big claws were meat eaters, right? You don't know what they use the claws for unless you saw it in action. And we can see the sloth has great big claws. And we can see it in action. We find out the sloth uses those to hang on to a branch or a tree. And he can lock them in position and sleep upside down off of a limb of a tree. Amazing locking mechanism of that particular uh, uh, ground sloth. And uh, that looks pretty well designed to be able to lock in the position while he is asleep. Okay. You know, birds have, there are about 900 species of birds, 600 permanent residents. They don't want to go anywhere. <laughs> All right. Um, 200 migratory. Uh, and then we have a whole bunch of good birds there. What we like doing is seeing people's eyes light up when they see the scarlet mackerel or even the seven species of hummingbirds or the toucans with the beautiful bills. Okay, the scarlet macaw actually can live, it's a type of the parrot family, it can live 65 to 80 years. It's interesting. And uh, what a blessing to see these large parrots. All right? But they mate for life, too. Hold it. How is that an evolutionary advantage? What happens to the mate dies? Frequently, they don't mate again. Evolutionary advantage? I thought they were supposed to be passing their genes on to as much as possible for evolution to occur. But they say, hmm, oh, beautiful color. <laughs> Mating advantage. The pretty bird gets the mate. Well, guess what? Males and females have the same plumage, the same look. No advantage there. All right. Oh, what happens when a, a scarlet macaw eats the wrong stuff? Gets parasites. He knows he's got parasites. So what does he do? He eats poisonous cedar sap. How did he learn it's okay to eat that stuff? It poisons something else. He eats it. It kills the parasites. So he's self-medicating here, isn't he? He knows what to do. Now, the idea that beauty is a mating advantage doesn't necessarily work with the macaws. Uh, what about the toucans or the peacock even? Now, peacocks are not native of Costa Rica, but because of their beauty and the fact that they can be domesticated, they went all over the world, including Costa Rica. But there's been a lot of research done on the peacock. And they said, oh, the beautiful plumes is what attracts the mate. Well, guess what? Not so fast. There has been 268 observations done in research on peacocks. They found out the splendid males did not win the attention of the females. That kind of set Darwinian evolution back, back a little bit because Darwin's mantra was, Beauty is a sexual advantage. 
it's going to track the mates. It didn't do it. And that was a 2008 article. All right. Well, wow. Look at the Aracari there. Beautiful bird. Beautiful beak. Part of the toucan family. You know, and the toucan's bills are approximately 30 to 50% of the size of the ant of the bird, but only 5% of the body weight. So it's extremely light. That uh, goes away from the fact that those big bills are used to crunch coconuts or something like that, something heavy. No. So Darwin's mantra, the prettiest bills was a mating advantage. It attracted the mates. Really, more research was done. Turns out, this is Natural Geographic News, 2009, says the brilliantly colored bills of toucans aren't just eye candy. Rather, they play an essential role in helping the birds control their temperature. Whoa, what happens? When it's colder, he puts the bill under his wing. The poor thing. <laughs> okay? And that helps him uh, control the temperature. And so uh, really important heat regulation systems, what the bill does, okay? So you can call that a highly engineered thermal regulator system. When it's cool, he pumps more blood up into his bill. That's why. It, and then what happens is it then heats up. And then he puts it under his wing. It heats the body cavity, all this kind of stuff. So it is a thermal regulatory system. No, not just eye candy, not just a sexual advantage. Okay? Hummingbirds. We love going to certain places. We take people at in uh, hummingbirds They uh, in uh, Costa Rica. They love the hummingbirds. We love taking pictures of them. And... Uh, it's amazing when you look at it, seven different species of hummingbirds. Um, the hummingbird wings flap 50 times normally per second. But when they want to put on a burst of speed or attract your female, guess what? They can go with speeds up the and flapping their wings 200 times per second. Whoa, that's a bunch. That's why you can hear them going along okay and it's i'm every anybody here people say uh oh i eat like a bird well think about it next time you hear that ask them like a hummingbird whereas sips of a hummingbird sips twice its body weight per day in nectar <laughs> so Eating like a bird, uh, it's not so good. All right. The tongue, they used to think it was kind of like a capillary action, um, or maybe they sucked it up. Uh, no, the tongue works more like a micro pump. Uh, it has two long, narrow tubes that unzip uh, in fragmented flaps when in contact with nectar. Then the flaps retract. The nectar in less than one twentieth of a second. <laughs> Rapid succession. Thousands of times each day. It's amazing. That's how we get so much nectar in and to, to get to one, two times its body weight. But there's a problem. When you eat that much nectar, you're going to have some metabolic heat. It's a problem. And not only that, when you're expending all that energy in uh, flapping your wings... That produces heat as well. So what happens to frictional and metabolic heat? Well, the airflow from flapping wings helps cool the outside. But God puts special design features as well inside. The heartbeat is a 500 to 1,200 times per minute. Boy, your doctor would really worry about if your heart was pumping like that when you went in for an exam. The respiration, 250 times per minute. And that helps cool the inside, both the heart rate and the respiration. 
So God thought of everything, even on a hummingbird. <laughs> you know, the modern idea is that birds evolved from dinosaurs. And I can't get the picture out of my mind what would a T-Rex look like trying to evolve into a hummingbird. That'll keep you up at night, I'm afraid. By the way, when you look at the fossil record of hummingbirds, when you find a fossil, it's 100% hummingbird. And here's a reviewer, Stockstad. Uh, uh, he actually said, the amazing thing about this fossil they found is that it's essentially a modern hummingbird. My mind is a little blown. And then, um, I like this one, where the whole hovering tribe came from remains up in the air. Love their humor. But what happens is whenever you find a fossil hummingbird, it's a hummingbird. No transition. The same thing as bats. Remember, there are quite a number of species of bats in Costa Rica, but they're very beneficial. Beneficial, keep down the uh, population of insects. But what about the fossil record? Bats also have always been bats. There are a thousand fossil bats found, not one intermediate. I think now they have almost 1,400 different fossil bats. Still, not one intermediate. Okay. And there are no known, no known intermediate stages between bats and insectivores. This is a problem for evolution here. Where did the bats come from? Oh, well, when I look at these things, I look at the hummingbird. Boy, they can go so fast. And the bats have wonderful camouflage. You may not see the two bats on the bark of that tree, but most of that picture is bats. And the hummingbirds are fast. They shouldn't have any enemies. Well, they do. They have the great big spiders, the orb spiders. Huh. And also, you see that little bit of yellow yarn like in the background for some reason i managed to get the picture of both the spider and the viper in the back and we've never seen vipers except for once when we first was down we're down in costa rica um 25 years ago roughly all right or 20 maybe but anyhow when when you look at a viper you know wow they have Amazing design. So you think of a creation and the fall. The fall. Things are eating each other, right? Yeah. But even the viper has amazing design features, even as a symbol of, uh, of uh, the fall. It has long fangs that fold back. Hmm. Infrared imaging capability that works like binocular vision. So with all of this, they can detect temperature differences of two one-thousandths of a degree. That's amazing. So they're actual, this actually works better than the, uh, the eye vision here. And it's so that's how they find it. And they can find a hummingbird as well. Okay. Now think about that orb spider, the big spider web. Um, this article came out in, uh, it said, making Costa Rica bulletproof. Why? Because the web of the orbs, golden orb spider is so strong. It can actually make a vest out of it and have it deflect bullets. Okay. Interesting. Here's a spider silk cape. And uh, just it's in a museum because it was so gorgeous, but it's made out of spider silk. And uh, but it can be used for bulletproof vests as well. The spider uh, web has uh, the silk is five times stronger than steel, and it's twice as stretchy as nylon, and it can remain perfectly waterproof. So that's why they're starting to work, make things out of that vest. And uh, so it works great. But why is that strand so strong? Because it's not just one strand. But under scanning electron microscope uh, activity, they were able to see the backside of a spider. Notice all of these little spinnerets. 
that is weaving these strands together like a weaving machine. And a cord of three, according to the Bible, is not easily broken, right? What about a cord of six? And that makes that particular strand of spider silk extremely strong. But question, do uh, weaving factories come about by accident? Nope. <laughs> nope, they sure don't. They don't come out by accident at all. That gives you a design feature that says somebody designed that. It looks like an engineering feat to do it. All right. We have marine organisms, whales, dolphins, sea turtles, etc. cetera. Uh, hmm. Very important. And uh, I love the dolphins. You know, when you look at the dolphins, think about it. Discover Magazine had an article a number of years ago about how the dolphins survive, basically. First of all, they swim in warm water. They swim in cold water. And uh, how do they regulate the temperature? Well, turns out the key is in the dorsal fin. In fact, Discover Magazine says the dolphin would bake to death inside of his own skin if it wasn't for the special uh, uh, principles uh, here to be able to adapt and make a radiator. And so think about the radiator of a dolphin. Um, it needs to get inside. The dolphin keeps warm in cold water because it has a very thick layer of blubber. It's really a good insulator, but too good of an insulator when it's in warmer water. And so the radiator fin, the blood is actually pumped up into the fin, circulates around and around, and comes really close to the water. And then that water cools the blood. When the blood is cooled, goes back into the body cavity and cools the rest of the dolphin. And you say, this is more efficient than the radiator of your automobile. So I say, that looks design. Okay? looks design and here's what the uh, discover magazine committed to naturalism by the way it says this graceful mammal avoids such a, f a fate baking to death only by slipping through the loopholes in the laws of physiology now i want you to think about that it sounds scientific but they didn't say a thing didn't say a thing, no explanation, just put some scientific jargon as a coat of paint over the problem that it looks designed. And we get to see those uh, dolphins down in Costa Rica. And so, uh, and there's other things we can do to talk about it. Think about the different reptiles there. And so you have uh, um, the alligators I like. What about this one? It's called the Jesus Christ lizard. Remember, Jesus Christ walked on water. Well, this one wa runs on water, and it can have the little air bubbles that it can actually uh, put between his foot and the water. And what happens is he can go about 16 miles per hour over the top of water. And uh, so he gets up on his back legs, and you think, wow, it's almost like a dinosaur here but it can really move and uh jesus christ lizard all right crocodiles one spot we get to see a lot although we're never close to them which is suits me just fine um anyhow but uh you can get down close to some of them and you find out when you do the research that they live in brackish water that means there's the ocean coming in to the river and so some of the time, the river, when the tide is low, is coming in, putting fresh water out there. But when the tide is up, now that water is quite salty. So what does a creature that lives around the water do? It can't handle that much salt. So it has to eliminate the salt. Well, with the alligator, it eliminates salt, excess salt, through his eyelids. <laughs> it's a salt elimination system. Uh, you know, it's, and the mangroves do the same thing. They bring that salt water up, 
And then they grow a lot of leaves, but they now drop their leaves to remove the salt of the brackish or the salt water. And so drop in leaves. And, oh, we love visiting the mangrove swamps. You see so much. It's so much fun to go up there in a little boat. Yeah. And you can find out many things like the seed pod. What's the advantage of that seed pod? Let's suppose a tree drops that thing. What happens? The weight in the bottom, right down into the mud. And now, again, it seeds another tree. And so that, even the seeds, illustrate uh, design, okay? So the, you have shorebirds, too. They have the same thing. Uh, they actually can eliminate salt. The herons, oh, this heron happens to go fishing. And it eliminates salt as well. What do you mean by going fishing? It's a smart bird. Smart design in this bird. He actually can take a pebble in his beak, a pebble, a little stone, or maybe a little piece of wood, something like that, and he drops it in the water and sits and waits. Real patient. And a little minnow or a fish comes up to explore the pebble and finds out instead of finding food to eat, they are eaten by the heron. So again, this is a bird that goes fishing. <laughs> the bee eater, another interesting feature about it. What? How do you eat a bee? Aren't you going to get stung? Well, here's the instructions for a bee eating bird. And this is on a sign. Once you have caught a bee, <laughs> wrap its head against a branch until it stops sting. Next, rub the bee's tail against the branch to remove the stinger and venom sac. Swallow whole or feed to chicks. And then they say a wasp, hornet, or other flying insect may be substituted. All right. How do they learn to do that? To be able to remove the stinger, etc., and still get a meal? God's design. Sometimes you see leaves like that, and, uh, whoa, look at that. What what uh, was eating on that thing? Well, actually, it's an ant that does that. You know, in the scripture, it says, go to the ant, you sluggard, and learn. What can you learn from ants? Well, you find out that these ants are leaf cutter ants. They cut a piece of leaf off of nice, fresh vegetation, and you can actually see them carrying the leaf pieces, all right? Many of them are much bigger than the ant, by the way. And they keep it, and then they bring it down into the holes. Here are the leaves coming down into there. Well, they're going to eat the leaves for a leader, right? Well, they let the leaves feed fungus down there. The fungus secretes a type of a sticky substance, okay? And so what happens? Ants like sticky stuff, especially when it's sweet. And so what these leaf cutter ants are doing, they are farming fungus. They're feeding the fungus. And so they know how to plant a harvest and take care of the harvest. And so more design. But they have to contend with an anteater. Another amazing design. <laughs> it can eat, one anteater can eat 25,000 ants per day. So they have to be careful where they put their ant hill, right? They can actually eat termites as well. Well, it turns out, remember that fall, the thorny trees that you don't want to climb up or especially skid down? <laughs> There's a symbiotic relationship between the ant and the tree. Ant eaters don't want to climb those trees. So the ants go up far enough, and that's where they live, and the tree protects them. But because of the ant is there, it causes a, um, uh, they can pollinate, etc. And they pollinate not only the tree, but the ecosystem living in the top of the tree. So it's a symbiotic relationship between the ant and the tree. And the tree protects the ants. 
Same thing with the termites. Here you see a termite trail going from the forest floor up the tree. And when it does, it's going to go all the way up to a termite mound right there. Sometimes the mounds are hanging like this great big one right here. Termite mounds. Do you realize in other countries and in Costa Rica that termites live in these clay-like mounds? And they can keep the temperature regulated, kind of like their own air conditioning. And if they're in a little bit colder climate, they can actually control it by heat as well. Amazing creatures. How do they learn to do that? But again, the tree protects them when they go up high in the tree. And eaters, termite eaters, don't get them. Okay, what are you looking at? I have people frequently say, ah, broccoli, celery. No, it happens to do with a foot of a gecko lizard. And in fact, every one of the pads of the gecko lizard have these little fine strands. You don't even see them unless you're looking at it with an electron scanning microscope. But the thing is, every pad has little, let's say one square inch, maybe 200 to 300 million strands like that. Now, you ever see a gecko lizard run across the ceiling? They can actually run across a plate of glass as well. And you think, whew, they'd fall off. Now, these fine strands make a molecular bond with the surface that it's touching. And it keeps it from falling off. And if you try to do a pull-up on a, a, a gecko lizard hanging on to a plate of glass from the ceiling, you'll probably demolish that lizard be, uh, before he, it would let go because the molecular bonds are so strong. But how do they release him if he wants to move? Well, when uh, you see a lizard, it kind of goes back and forth. It's releasing the bonds because those molecular bonds are directional, directional. And so, huh, so you can move and run across a plate of glass and still hold on and make contact. Wouldn't it be nice to make a pair of gloves out of this type of material? Well, guess what? This is called biomimicry. They actually have a new type of one-sided Velcro that they're making. And it's inspired by the gecko lizard, 260 million fibers per square inch. And they were able to figure out how to make it directional bonds. Their goal is to make Spider-Man gloves, okay? Or wouldn't that be nice for a window washer? Wouldn't have to have all those ropes and all that uh, stuff that slows them down. You can just go right up the building, really fast, washing the window. <clears throat> Hopefully, doesn't hit that perfect um, direction that the bonds break. Down he'd go. <laughs> okay. And so uh, that's a new adhesive, biomimicry. What we have to do, what we are doing is looking at what God has made to make better inventions. We've been doing that for a long time. In fact, I give a program strictly on bio mimicry sometimes some of the things that they uh, are able to do so sticky tape turns mortals into spider-man you can look at that uh, on the web if you want to do that you know we have um 175 species of amphibians in costa rica there are frogs make up about 85 percent of that lots lots of frogs and they are beautiful frogs, but their beauty, beautiful, but don't kiss them. Yep, not going to turn into a prince, but it might poison you. Okay, these are poison dart frogs, all right? Beautiful frogs. And uh, the blue gene frogs and the uh, this particular one right here, it's actually uh, a, of the same family, of the same family as this one. And this one, too. I love the frogs down there. And uh, I really love the, uh, oops, excuse me, the um, uh, the red-eyed frog. 
I really love that frog. All right. They're, they're fun. You can actually hold those in your hand. They don't bother you, but I don't want to do that with the one on the bottom or even the blue jeans frog. Don't really want to do that or all three of them. Don't kiss them. Okay. They actually secrete a poison and there's enough poison on the skin of a frog normally that would probably be enough to poison and kill 10 individual people. That can be pretty scary, huh? But they usually don't bother you. You really have to aggravate them to get them to secrete. And this is what the uh, natives uh, in Colombia and where they uh, use the, they use uh, darts, blowguns. What they would do is tip their little arrows or a bone arrow with um, poison from the poison dart frogs and use it to kill things. And um, what they would do is take frogs. I know it's not very humane, but they would actually put them in some kind of a little container and kind of mash them down just a little bit, enough to get them mad. And they begin secreting all this poison toxins. And, um, and now they save that and they tip their arrows with that. And uh, this particular poison works on what's called the sodium gate protein. And uh, um, that sodium gate protein is what uh, keeps things going smoothly for you. And if you block the sodium gate, what it does is causes the muscles to lock up. And it affects the heart, keeps stops it from be bleeding and that's how it kills something is because the heart is stopped and uh so basically the question is why don't <clears throat> poison darts the frogs poison themselves why don't they well interesting because they poison target sodium gate protein but the frog itself has the sodium great gate protein except for one thing think about a protein as being a string of beads each bead represents a specific amino acid by the way if you get the wrong amino acid in the wrong space it could be deadly uh, but you have to have them all in the right spot 1800 and 36 amino acids in the sodium gate protein. Wait a minute. What's the probability of getting all those lined up? <laughs> I'm not going to calculate it. But if you had only 260 or if you had 200 amino acids in the string, uh, the chance of, uh, of uh, getting those lined up perfectly is like hiding a marble, a blue one that you painted special in a universe total universe filled with marbles and then going out in a spaceship accidentally blindfolded finding your marble not once not twice but three times in a row if you could do that it's a hundred million times easier than making one simple 200 amino acid protein but this guy has 1836 amino acids you can understand the probability is uh, astronomically bad but here's how the keeps from poisoning itself in the poison dart there is one amino acid that's different it's in position 1584 and if that particular amino acid is changed to a different amino acid now that doesn't lock up the sodium gate and the frog is perfectly okay now think about it sounds like god put it in specially gave them the defense mechanism okay probably so and then allowed him to have one change of amino acid which means it wouldn't poison himself do you think mutations with natural selection is going to produce this that one specific 
amino acid in 1,500 or 836 of them. No, it just defies imagination. What makes more sense is that there was a creator God who did it. And of course, naturalism. <laughs> we can imagine how mutations coupled with natural selection might refine or produce these features. <laughs> you can imagine all you like. But it's not going to happen. Everything is so specific detail. And number two, remember John Sanford, what he said? Mutation and natural selection is basically bankrupt. And it does not work at all. Okay? So that's the primary axiom. Careful analysis. Primary axiom, absolutely dead wrong. This whole idea... The mutation natural selection, say applied to the poison dart frogs, can be confidently rejected. Okay? And other things as well. All right. Now, all right. Keep in mind evolution is not science. It's a worldview or a philosophy posing as science. And evolution is the pillar of it. Okay? Uh, all right. Now, so when we look at that, Genesis 1 to 11, we see the creation, amazing evidence of design. We see the fall and death, etc. But we still see gorgeous beauty wherever we look, don't we? It's, it's all over. Look at the parrots, look at the butterflies, etc. We see all that. And when we go to Costa Rica, we can see evidence of the flood and the fossils, like in the this particular rock there along the ocean, uh, has all those uh, little uh, kind of pointy tortilla type shells, and uh, again, mass burial. But look at all this beauty, such beauty. But remember, we had a flood. We have volcanism. This is a destroyed world, but keep in mind, God makes beauty out of destruction, doesn't he? He makes tremendous beauty out of that. He does that in our hearts and lives, too. We can mess up our lives horribly, have a life of sin, all kinds of stuff, but God can make beauty out of a destroyed life. And that's something to really consider and worship God about, isn't it? And the Costa Rican people love to worship God, the creator God. But of course, the university, what are they teaching? Naturalism. But you know what? I think God is worthy to be praised. He gives promises, okay? And uh, and so basically, um, I'm going to uh, say, you know, there are many things to look at in Costa Rica. What about the rock? Look at the rock. These are stone spheres that the indigenous people made. And in fact, we have had people say, oh, those things are so perfectly round. It had to be aliens that formed them. <laughs> we hear that very regularly. It had to be atheans, aliens that did it. And that's an eight-foot sphere perfectly round. Now, we're not supposed to be worshiping the rock, but we can appreciate the people that made them. And I remember being in a, Mary Jo and I were in a restaurant with a friend, uh, and we were getting ready. We're going to go down this, to where the stone spheres were. And we think they might have been used for uh, 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 guides in a jungle, uh, maybe painted it, whitewashed, so that people know where the trails are. And maybe a mapping on it? Uh, we think so. Why would they use a stone sphere for that? Because wood would rot because of the termites down there. So use stone. And uh, and it seems like the more prominent the chieftain is in the village, the more of these stone spheres they would have. This young lady we happen to meet. <laughs> Sweet gal. But... She basically worshipped the creation rather than the creator. And that is dangerous to do. But anyhow, she loved the stone spheres as well. All right. And uh, do you realize how smart those people were? Was it aliens? So when we were in that restaurant, we had people say, oh, 
you're going to go down and see the stone, stone spheres. And um, they say, well, in the, uh, the culture down there, they said, oh, native people didn't have iron tools. They didn't have whatever. They couldn't make spheres that beautifully round. Well, yeah, they could. They had jade instruments. Jade is as tough as steel sometimes. Okay. In fact, you use a, in China, they used to use a block of jade as an anvil to forge uh, metal. Uh, so basically, yeah, they had stuff that would work. And so we were talking about these stone spheres and somebody came up and said, are you, are you talking about these stone spheres? You want to see some, how they're made? My uncle makes them and he lives out here. Okay, well, guess what? We're on another expedition looking for the uncle and hoping it's not a setup or something. But uh, here we are out in four wheel driving it to get up there. And sure enough, we talked to the uncle and he shows us the different stone, stone spheres he's made and he showed one that about six feet in diameter, a little bit smaller than that one. And he said, Oh, yeah, I can, I sell these things to museums. <laughs> uh, that one's about. Uh, he gave me a figure, the equivalent, six thousand dollars. <laughs> Anyhow, so uh, yeah, and all he uses is a little bit of a hammer, chisel, and a piece of rope to be able to measure to get the perfect curvature. All right. Then we find out that the ancient people used the lost wax method of casting. They'd make a forge-like thing, and then they could actually make these uh, beautiful pieces of jewelry. And uh, we use the same lost wax method of casting uh, uh, today. And we can use the same method if we wanted to. Um, Bruce Malone wrote a book called Brilliant, Made in the Image of God. People were made in the image of God and were creative as well. And they're brilliant. They weren't dumb. The original people, they had a language. They had lived with God. Uh, Adam and Eve lived with God for a while. He lived 900 years. They're pretty smart, weren't they? Well, why do people like to go to Costa Rica? Why do I like to go to Costa Rica? I love photography. I love being able to interact with the people. Love the people down there. This is our tour guide, Oscar. He loves photography, too. Why? Photography. Things are so beautiful all around. Beauty is an evidence of design, isn't it? Yeah, God is an artist. He loves beauty. It is all over Costa Rica. And uh, we see that. The flowers, even the crabs. <laughs> even the crabs are beautiful. <laughs> and uh, the beaches. Oh, yeah. God makes beauty out of destruction, doesn't he? Uh, we love looking at the foliage. Uh, wow, look at the leaves. And uh, birds. Oh, people are ingenious too. Ingenious too. In fact, they make water wheels for electricity, uh, waterfalls. Here's an interesting tree right here. It's called a uh, walking tree. Hmm. No, it doesn't walk. It doesn't actually walk, but it puts down roots from the kind of the vines growing down and it sends the roots out further like this way. And if it sends it out further this way, it looks like the center of the tree kind of moves in one direction or another. No, the tree didn't uh, walk, but the roots did. Then we also see bananas all over down there. Now that was actually introduced into Costa Rica and the banana plants. And it really has some great banana plantations. But I want you to notice something about the core of that banana stalk. It looks like a spiral, doesn't it? Do you remember the Fibonacci sequences that basically has the hand of God? One of our staff uh, men, Lanny Johnson, wrote that book on the hand of God, and he talks about the signature that God has on his creation. Look at the leaves on the stem of a tree. It follows the same pattern like a spiral. Spiral arm galaxies, same way. Interior, uh, look at the sunflower. Again, spirals. 
or the banana stalk down there, Costa Rica. You see the spirals. A specific uh, amount it's called a Fibonacci sequence mathematically. And it looks like that was God's handiwork. So we love to look at different things. Look at the root structure on that tree right there. It's, uh, it's absolutely amazing when you look at that. Uh, photography, the monkeys, uh, <laughs> they're smart. They're really smart. Uh, they'll run off with a camera if you're not careful. I don't know if they take pictures and look at them later, but they'll run off with your cal camera. They might even trade it for food. It's hard telling. But anyhow, when you look in the top of a tall tree, there's another evidence of design. Evidence of God utilizing every niche of his creation. God caused his uh, creation to be inhabited, didn't he? He made it to be inhabited. When you look at the tree, you'll notice on the branch of the tree, whoops, I didn't want to go backwards, uh, right to the right of the frog's nose. Notice the branch is kind of curved to the main tree. But look at that. You have what looks like, if you're from the Southwest, yucca plant. It's actually a type of a, a, of a, a plant, and it sends down little roots down below. But inside of that happens to be the whole thing is another ecosystem growing on the, on the branch. This is an ecosystem within the ecosystem. And you go up the branches of the tree, you see more ecosystems. It's rather intriguing um, because the frogs will actually lay their eggs. Now, they don't want their eggs eaten. So they actually take, uh, when they tadpoles hatch, if they take the tadpoles in their mouth up into the upper part of that uh, a tree in the branch and those type of leaves that you see right there next to the nose of the frog allows water to congregate below and makes little pools and the tadpoles do really well safe and protected okay God protects his creation too. And when they get old enough as little frogs, they can crawl down the tree. All right. They can leave that protection. And so such beauty, beautiful butterflies. Why so much diversity and beauty? Because God is an artist. We see that really in Costa Rica, major artist. And he loves beauty, doesn't he? Beauty in the flowers, beauty in the insects and the birds, beauty of the ocean. We also say God paints the sky as well. One of the many, many gorgeous sunsets. I love that one right there. God is an artist. He painted the sky. And we have to thank him for what he had made. When we look at the beauty in Costa Rica, when we look at the intricate design of things, even when we look at the DNA within every cell, what does he say? It's created with the design. The evidence cries that out. We really see it in Costa Rica. We believe it speaks volume. We can see design if we're willing to open our eyes to look for God's handiwork. Okay? However, if we have naturalism, then our eyes are blinded. I'm blinded to what God has made. And we are without excuse. That's basically what Romans said, isn't it? So I say, let's open our eyes. Let's take in all of the beauty, all of the design that God has made and worship him as our creator God. All right. So thank you for listening to me. A couple of minor things here. Um, tomorrow, uh, Mary Jo and I are given part two of a three-part series on uh, the creation versus evolution crash class. And we're hoping that people will be able to stand firm against what we call the semi-truck evolution and anti-God semi. And uh, young people leaving the church are getting mowed over 
by this by the semi and uh 80 up to 75 to 85 percent lose lose it in the college by the time they graduate well this crash class is supposed to help them stand firm tomorrow one o'clock one o'clock uh darwin and the fossils today we had uh, biology and design we had different things as far as design there's so many things we could talk about and so if you want to know more about it email me at uh, uh our uh, dave nutting at discovercreation.org we will give uh, more tours of costa rica by the way if you're interested uh next creation tour is next winter february 25 to march 5 2024 and we go to some amazing places and if you want to know about that let us know you can just go down there with us discover creation and don't worship the creation but worship the creator that made it next summer we're going to be doing more yellowstone creation tours uh we gave three of them this particular summer so next summer email aoi at discovercreation.org for any of this information on things that i'm talking about or dave nutting at discovercreation.org i'll make sure you get some of that stuff we do have a free newsletter a member that blue morpho is in our think and believe newsletter uh you can go ahead and when you uh email me you can ask for that uh think and believe uh as well and it comes out once every two months okay and uh when you look at the aoi's uh website we really recommend you come to our website many resources we can you can learn about uh about creation versus evolution the upcoming events our camps and tours like our yellowstone tour or our costa rica tour or creation training and that's that bar right up there uh we were trying to uh train young people to help impact the college which just happens to be one half block away from us right here from where i'm standing or sitting okay other resources books uh past issues of think and believe and the bookstore a kids section that's our website and of course a donate button and we just realized that people will go to our website discovercreation.org they could donate and they could do it uh, one time or on a monthly basis to help us continue to put together these programs and impact the young people for christ all right and so again let me re I mention february 25 march 5 costa rica and uh we have a dvd set you could purchase it's only 35 dollars for you guys 12 sessions uh I, and it includes a full color 75 page study guide to go along with it and other books too including the latest on human evolution john sanford's book um i love this one and others in the series have you considered by bruce malone and julie von vett and um uh, by the way, Julie is definitely very heavily involved in the Minneapolis Twin Cities Creation Group, where I'm going to be speaking uh, mid-October. Okay, uh, have you considered every day? You can open up the page. Oh, it's September 12 today. Read the devotion, the scripture. Also read the science for that day whether it be biology, geology, paleontology, whatever. One page, full color. Another one in that series is without excuse. And they're $14, $15. That's all. Okay, Global Flood, one of my best, uh, my favorite books on, uh, on the flood right there. Guides to Yellowstone. And I will say one thing. We have made a phone app as well guide to the colorado national monument was mentioned before we even got started today guide to colorado national monument to show you every little every stop and what you're seeing there and it's a full thing a guy from the national park there said 
that's better than anything the National Park has produced. And uh, we did the same thing with Yellowstone National Park, too. A full tour guide of that. And besides the tours, we give seminars all over the country. So we can go to individual churches, speak there. We have five speaking teams on the Alpha Omega Institute uh, uh, roster here. So we can uh, send somebody out to your place or maybe Mary Jo and I can come out as well. All right. So we do all that as well. We bring the books with us and um, pray for us. We just almost have completed the upstairs remodel for being able to house students to be able to help us impact that university one half block away. So pray for its completion. Um, people ask, when is it going to be done? I say, last fall. <laughs> okay. So many roadblocks. Okay. And go to our website and visit often discovercreation.org. God bless you guys. And uh, do you have any questions? I believe you said there's going to be a question and answer. And I'm going to try to um, see if I can uh, stop my screen share. Can you hear me, Dave? There we go. Excellent. All right. That was a tremendous presentation. I enjoyed it. I hope you guys did. Oh, it was awesome. <laughs> um, you saved us a couple thousand dollars tonight by not having to fly down to Costa Rica. We learned a lot tonight. Well, no, not really. I hope it whetted your appetite, too. <laughs> no, no, you did. You, wet, you whetted our appetite, that's for sure. Yeah, I think it may have cost a few people a couple thousand dollars just to, because they'll want to come and yeah. join us. Yeah, excellent. I'm sure. I, I don't blame them. It's a wonderful place to go. I, we started going down there doing university ministry and church ministry um, uh, way back when, uh, 17, 18 years ago. Um, and uh, then after a number of years of doing that, we were able to go to different places as well and see things. And we got to thinking, we're enjoying this these extra days so much. Uh, I'll bet you other people would enjoy it too. And that's why we ended up putting the tours together to Costa Rica. And I have a full-time uh, tour uh, guy who arranged it. He comes on every one of our tours and uh, he knows it. He goes there so he can make sure that everything is going smoothly. Uh, we have a full-time naturalist guide that goes with us boy they know their stuff down there and i love learning from them but then we also add some of the things to help them and these are christian and uh, guides as well and so uh that that's just amazing to have them with us on that those tours this last year <laughs> it seems weird but uh this last year we have the tour all put together ready to go uh, ready to be uh meet our tour group and um all of a sudden i um uh, uh am showing signs of big problems with uh covid and it turns out that i missed the and both mary jo and i missed our entire tour that we put together for the people but we had trained enough people to take over in Costa Rica, which we love doing, training people to do the creation message. And, uh, and we trained them, and they were able to take over without really missing a beat. Oh, that's so good. praise that's the Lord good. for that. Okay. So, so do we have any and, questions here tonight in our audience? Anybody have a question? Okay, we have a question here from a gentleman named Dave. Hello, Dave. This is Dave Demick. This sounds like Dave Demick there. I remember <laughs> you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, we, we go back a ways. Yeah. Um, you've but, written uh, some articles for us, too, and published in Take and Believe. So you've got a great creationist uh, expert there in Hastings, don't you? <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, Good thanks, to hear your voice. Th thanks for the compliment, Dave. Maybe, maybe I can write some more for you one of these days. Um, my, my, I actually have two questions tonight. One is, 
Uh, did the Mayan civilization and ruins and pyramids get as far south as Costa Rica? Uh, you know, I didn't show any pyramids. They do have some uh, pyramids structures in Costa Rica. Um, one year ago, we had a personal tour from an archaeologist who has been doing amazing amount of, uh, of research on, the, uh, um, on some of the native people down there. And uh, they actually had uh, roads constructed three, five miles long. And uh, they actually made roads. Uh, they had small pyramids as well. And um, so that the excavation, the guy that I talked about has been excavating uh, down there since uh, 1948. Mm. Okay, that's quite a while. And I think he was about ready to retire. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that sounds interesting. I, I, that, that would be fun to know more about that and how that, that influence of, of making pyramids and so on uh, got into uh, Costa Rica. Uh, my All right, I'm going to be uh, turning up my volume a little bit, at least on the... Uh, Let's see if I can hear you better. Okay, yeah, I, I, I should talk into it a little bit more. How's, how's that? Perfect. I hope I'm not blasting you out now. No, you're, you're fine. Um, okay. my, my other question is about the uh, poison dart frog and about that, that sodium gate protein that, uh, that is, is toxic. Uh, how, does, how does the frog mutate its own protein? How, uh, how did what? Or how does the frog mutate its own protein? Yeah, how does that do that? It didn't. It was designed with that protein in the right spot. Oh, the okay. right amino acid in the right spot. Because mutation is not going to produce it. Uh -huh. uh, in that one specific thing with that one specific uh, amino acid. I mean, it's got to have it precisely pinpointed with that specific number you might say bead on that chain of amino acid chains making making that up um and it can't pre it won't be able to uh think about it ahead of time and said i need to develop a poison but first so i don't poison myself i better develop uh, this thing to be able to keep from getting poisoned once i develop this thing it's a, it doesn't think about it. Its mutations are supposedly strictly accidents. Mm -hmm. And the accidents are finally perfected over millions of years. There are not enough millions of years to be able to make that one specific uh, a change in that uh, protein. Besides, how did you get all of those particular amino acids put together in the right order? 1,800 and some proteins. Uh, or yeah. amino acids. How do you do that? Uh, yeah. All of that mm -hmm. entire system. The only thing is no design, no special mutation. It's just a pinpoint spot that God knew what to do. I don't think people would have known, but they kept n noticing when they did the research on it um, that that sequence was only different in that one spot. Mm -hmm. That's how they figured it out. Okay, and uh, then they found out, huh, it's got a different uh, amino acid there. Hmm. And uh, if you want to, if uh, anybody else, you or anybody else wants to know, uh, you can go to, um, well, you can go to icr.org, Institute for Creation Research, and look up poison dart or dart fro uh, frogs, poison dart frog. And you'll be able to get m more information on that. Or you can go to some of the technical journals and they'll tell you exactly how it was, not how it was formed. Of course, they're going to give you mutation, natural selection. It doesn't work, but uh, that's what they'll tell you. But you can go to secular sources and find out uh, the specifics of that sodium gate and how it uh, uh, blocks the muscles and the, causes them to uh, lock up so uh, they don't they free they freeze basically yeah with yeah, the, uh, it, it paralyzes 
But you know what? What is the advantage of that? I mean, why would God create something so lethal? You know, one paper clip of of the golden of uh, free frog that's in Colombia, one paper clip amount of weight of that toxin is enough to kill 250 individual people. Uh, why would he create that? But you know, since you've been in the medical areas, you know that uh, uh, there are many things that might be lethal, but can be used in a certain disease uh, control or disease healing. And they've actually found that toxin and very, very minute, this toxin from poison darts can be used in minute quantities, actually in certain diseases. Mm -hmm. Okay, So God put yeah. those plants there. He put the frogs there. Maybe they say the plants are for the healing of the nations. How about the toxin of the poison dart frog as well? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. We just have to, great are the works of God and uh, worthy to study, correct? Yeah find out not just attributed to uh millions of years of uh evolutionary mutations and then forget it find out why god put it there what yeah. are we to learn by it mm -hmm. yeah i'll, I'll, I'll okay. look i'll look a little bit more into that um the the technical aspects but as i understand it right now uh the the the, the, the frog is able to make the poison which is a miracle in itself and, yeah. then, and then it's able to make the variant, which is not poisonous, uh, and which which is even more of a miracle. But I'll, well, it doesn't I'll, I'll make to... a variant which is not poisonous. It makes one point change, which makes it not the the poison. Uh, normally, on other creatures, that particular spot will cause it to freeze up. Okay, but this one. Even if it has its own toxin, it, because of that one amino acid and that one spot, the sodium gate does not freeze up. Mm -hmm. That's what yeah. happens. Okay? Yeah. Okay. Thank and you, near Dave. as I can tell with my very uh, limited <laughs> knowledge of this, these systems, okay? Okay. Yeah. Th thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Good question. to hear you. Great question, Dave. Any other yeah, questions? Any other questions from our audience? I have a question here. Hi, Dave. My name is Greg Smith. Um, it, it looked like from the map that you showed of Costa Rica and that line of volcanoes that there's a mountain range that bisects the country. Is that correct? There is a... Um Yes, uh, you have the volcanic strip. The lower part does not affect it as much. Okay. Uh, but the thing is, there you have another overthrust coming in from a different direction. Okay? And uh, we don't have the volcanics involved with that in the, in the lower part of the country. And I guess my question is, do you see then a distinct biodiversity on the Pacific side versus the Atlantic side versus the southern region of the country? You know, you do, but when you have so much ocean surrounding it, uh, you find out that there would be some similarities. There will be a difference in timing of some of the uh, dry season versus wet season from the Caribbean side versus the Pacific side. Okay, and even on the Pacific side, that's very dry there. Uh, when you go to the coastal range or the coastal uh, beaches on the Pacific side, uh, way out there on the far west of the country, it's pretty, it's fairly dry there. And to get to there from the capital city, you go over the mountain range, you're going to be into forests and whatever and lush vegetation. You'll come to uh, the region uh, Gonacoste uh, there, and that's more of an African savanna look. 
<laughs> okay. And, uh, but they still get more rain than uh, other parts of the world, that's for sure. But uh, being that close to the ocean. Uh, but uh, yeah, we see a distinction. Caribbean um, God, probably can tend to have much more rain over there. Okay? Usually. So we'll see different uh, 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 vegetation. We go on canals and boats in the Caribbean area, whereas uh, uh, it's a ver different vegetation that you'll see on the west side, which would be uh, more of the mangroves, okay? Mangrove swamps and uh, mangroves. Yeah, I think I got that right. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Dave. Uh -huh. Do we have any other questions? Or By the way, I love going over on the Caribbean side. They actually have a place that uh, I remember years ago, we were able to take a little uh, uh, guide, a uh, guided tour uh, by the people of the Sloth Refuge. And this is a place, you know, sloths don't move very quickly. And uh, so uh, the mama sloth and can be run over by automobiles crossing the road pretty easily. And so they take the young in or the damaged ones or the babies and they actually uh, uh, give them a home. And it's called the Sloth Refuge. And I love seeing that. Uh, that one picture of the sloth in the basket with the big sharp claws I showed, uh, that's from that sloth refuge. I took that picture there. And, uh, uh, but they had some uh, little tiny channels that we were able to take a small canoe up to see some of the amazing things in those little swampy areas. Okay, so yep. you know, that's, a, that's a fun spot to go to. Okay. Uh, one more uh, quick question. Um, with all the volcanics there, are, are, are there any sedimentary rocks with fossils uh, in Costa Rica? Yes, you do find some. I showed one picture along the beach and the rocks, and you see those little uh, pointed uh, cone-shaped uh, fossils. It can be anywhere from one inch to uh, four or five inches long. Uh, and uh, uh, those are one spot you find some fossils. In the southern part, you can also see uh, even limestone deposits, okay, down there. And uh, they actually quarry some of that down in the southern part of the country. So you will see some uh, fossil deposits there. Okay. And unrelated, but curious about your app for the national parks. Are you, you planning to expand those to other parks as well? Yes. We'd like to do that. Uh -huh. and uh, we've got Yellowstone and the Colorado National Monument area. Beautiful Red Rock. Our next uh, project happens to be the uh, uh, arches mm -hmm. and canyon lands will follow suit. And we're going to have others possibly even to the Grand Canyon. So we mm -hmm. think so. How, um, how do you access those? How do you uh, Go to our website at discovercreation.org. And right now, they are no, uh, mentioned, and uh, you have a little bit of a, uh, a thing that you can actually go right to our website, and that will tell you how to access that. So, uh, for instance, uh, to get the one on uh, Colorado National Monument to go to – C O L O Colorado, spell it out, and N A T apostrophe L Monument Tour. And it'll be the first thing that pops up. Okay. And the Google Store, or excuse me, the, um, the app store. Um, and that's uh, good for both Android and also for iPhones. Okay. Same thing on Yellowstone National Park. It'd be ya Yellowstone National Park tour and then look for our logo it's basically a coiled ammonite and you'll see that there's colors on it too and uh, uh that'll be our app okay Terrific. or you can search <laughs> search for alpha mega institute 
um, Colorado National Monument app. But but if you go to our website, it'll show it to you. And uh, it's amazing. You will open it up. You look at the app. Open up the front page of it. You'll see the app. And you'll have uh, many things you can choose. Geology. Overview. History. Uh, hiking. Uh, places to stop. That includes restrooms, which is very important in Yellowstone. Uh, and a whole bunch of other things uh, that are there. The fauna and the uh, uh, flora that you have. You can click on that. And you can click on, say, uh, flora, or let's go fauna. And you say, okay, now it gives you a list of different animals. And you might say uh, bighorn sheep or uh, elk. And it'll talk about the elk and even give you design features of those uh, creatures. Okay? Yeah. And uh, you can either do it... Uh, read what it says or you can do it hands free because this thing is also geared to accept gps and so basically you get close to a site it says you are approaching such and such turnout here's what you're going to see okay mm -hmm. and uh, we want it to be hands free as you talked about it earlier you said uh, you had a <laughs> there was a problem with uh, 1000 foot drop offs well, you don't want to be typing on your app and looking at your app when you're driving. <laughs> good, good Not point. a smart idea. <laughs> so, yeah. so we did that both with Yellowstone and even on the, uh, um, we're at, you're on, uh, let's say, Midway Geyser Basin. You can click on it from the armchair if you want, and you can find out, okay, Midway Geyser, Midway, Oh, that's got sapphire pool. It's got this. It's got this other thing too. Okay, and uh, and so you can click on any one of those pins, find out information, or you can walk on that walkway. And as you are approaching or driving, uh, you can, uh, as you're approaching, and say, "Oh, you're approaching the uh, sapphire pool, hot hot spring," and uh, here's what you're seeing. And if you want, you can then click on that. And click on the photo of it too, and so we've got pictures uh, on all the majors, all the most, uh, the major sites, even minor sites. It's very, very comprehensive. Wow. Okay. Yeah, excellent. Thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. But okay. that's a free. That's a free download, and we do ask uh, uh, if uh, basically if you want to, you can donate. Uh, uh, there's a donate button on that uh, app too, because people do like to be able to support those kind of things. So very good, Dave. Or yeah, Dave. Uh, yeah. Excellent presentation tonight. Blessings to you. Uh, I don't think we have any further questions. So okay. uh, I uh, wish you well. Thanks for well, your time. Thanks. I just got a message from one of the your participants from Jackson, Wyoming. Absolutely love the Costa Rica design lecture. <laughs> so very good, very thanks good. For, thank you guys for putting this on, and thanks for the invitation to come. Uh, that's a blessing, and uh, and so uh, uh, anyhow, we do speak all over. If you are in an individual church, want creation seminars, uh, rather you know this is a specialty one. I love doing it too, but we also do lectures on the best biological proofs for evolution, what's wrong with them, geological proofs. Thursday's uh, one would be the archaeology. We give that one archaeology and geology, indicating there's a flood. We give a rendition of that one at church seminars or universities as well. And so keep that all that in mind, okay? Again, thank you very much. Uh, blessings to you. and. Uh... I think we'll close at that. Sounds good. Thank you very much. God bless. Okay. Uh, let's see. I put the paper in my pocket here. I am okay. November fourteenth. Uh, 
Turkey, <laughs> Turkey expedition. Andrew Jones will be the speaker and uh, should be very, very interesting. It will follow the symposium in October on Noah's Ark and Mount Ararat. So there Good. could be some very interesting updates from that, uh, that symposium. So we're looking forward to that one and hope you can join us for that. November 14th. Okay. November 14th, 7 o'clock Central Standard Time.